There we go. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Finn Locustain, the founder of the Food and Global Security Network and producer of the Farmgate podcast. COP27 is over. Temperatures continue to rise and there's still no consensus about the role of land use and agriculture. So did anything good emerge from Sharm El Sheikh in terms of food system and climate change? Well, for this webinar, I'm joined by three experts who are going to help us understand what happened at COP27, who were each at COP27. Patty Fong is the Programme Director for Climate and Health and Wellbeing for the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. Adele Jones is the Executive Director of the Sustainable Food Trust. And Chantal Wei Ying Clement is the Deputy Director of IPES Food. Welcome all. Thanks so much for being here. Now, I'm sure that by now we all know the format of these things. I'm going to lead a discussion with our panelists for. 40 minutes or so, and after that we'll take questions, so please use the chat bar to post any queries that you have, uh, and if they come in as we go, I might well take one or, few, uh, one or two of the questions as we go along. Chantelle, can I come to you first? An IPES food news release over the weekend said that COP27 had agreed a farming deal. What is it? Um, thanks. Firstly, thanks for bringing us all together for this discussion. I just said it in the chat. I don't know how everyone else is feeling, but my mind is still reeling from the experience that is COP. So looking forward to this opportunity to air out any grievances together um, post COP. But I'd probably start by saying that farming deal somehow sounds maybe too ambitious relative to what came out of COP. But but this deal is referring to the Coronivia joint work on agriculture. And um, the Cornivia process was agreed on back in 2017 at the COP, I think it was in, I'm not gonna say, I, I'm not sure which one it was, but COP 2017. And it was supposed to be a four year process dedicated to focusing on agriculture under the UNFCCC. So this was really the UNFCCC finally recognizing the potential of agriculture in tackling climate change. Um, so at COP 27, negotiators were meant to discuss what the next phase of Cornivia would look like. Um, and, you know, in light of the food price crisis, all the links that we've been seeing between food system and climate over the past year, many of us really saw this as an opportunity, not only for the UNFCCC to tackle the role of agriculture on climate change, but, you know, to finally take this much needed food systems approach on these questions and to look at the role of the whole food system on climate change. Um, you know, we I'm not going to recap the details. We know that food systems contribute, you know, one third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So again, this was a real opportunity for us to look at how food systems aren't just the root cause of a lot of climate change issues, but, but can be a big part of the solution. And just to recap the negotiations really quickly, what was frustrating is that these negotiations on agriculture just really turned in circles this year to the point that we weren't even sure that we'd get a final text or a deal by the end of the two weeks of COP. Um, and just to note that the final text for this phase of Cornivia was something that was supposed to be agreed on last year at COP26, uh, but that failed to get done, so it was pushed back to this year. Um, and, and again, to, to briefly recap, the process was really mired with difficulties from the get-go. And we can maybe unpack that later, but you know, important solutions like agroecology were taken out of the draft text over the summer in June. Um, some governments in Sharm el Sheikh, like, like India, simply just didn't want to link mitigation to agriculture, which the draft text originally did. Um, and I think a lot of our hopes that Kernivia might expand to talk about food systems rather than just agriculture were completely dashed. So, you know, many countries didn't want to include food systems because they didn't want to bring in something new. They didn't want to widen the scope beyond agriculture because they thought it might slow down progress. So, yes, it was historic that the UNFCCC process dealing with agriculture was agreed on at this COP. But, you know, many of us saw that this, this farm deal um, sort of had a weak conclusion to what could have been this really landmark decision to include food systems approaches within the UNFCCC. So what was agreed? You've talked about the things that were taken out of it, the things that I think probably many of us listening today would kind of assume kind of ought to be in it. So what, what was left at the end? Um, I might turn to Patty, actually, who was following this, this process really closely, but just to briefly say, the, the conclusions were mostly that, you know, we need to keep working on food and agriculture in the coming years. Um, so Coronivia was sort of established as an ongoing process. It wasn't just, you know, 2017 to, to 2022. Um, so I think, you know, there was just a lot of recognition that we need to be dealing with agriculture and food security. I think the text was mostly around adaptation and the need for continued conversation. Uh, but what the agenda will formally look like, my understanding is that will be discussed in June and then at the upcoming COP, but I'll, I'll pass it to Patty who, who knows the details. 
So what was so what was negotiated over the two weeks was actually not the details of Cronibia or next mandate. It's they call it a cover text. It's a political statement that's coming out of all the countries who are there and present about what are the priorities. And there's different sections for different issues throughout. So there's a section about, and really it's boiled down to literally one paragraph of what the next mandate would look like. And so, you know, as you know, when you go to negotiate, you you haggle over every single word. So food systems was in, it was taken out. A workshop on food system was in, it was taken out. Holistic approach to agriculture and food security was in, and then it was holistic approach was taken out. And now you're left with agriculture and food security. So I guess food security or food is in for the first time, if you want to be optimistic. Um, and it, it, what it does, it sets a kind of a baseline for the negotiation of the kind of actual detail of what the framework's going to include. So it just makes, you know, Allah's going to keep pushing for food systems and agroecology in the coming year for it to be included and basically include it as a topic in the workshops and dialogues in the coming years. But because there is no reference into the political statement, it makes it a lot harder to argue for it. So if we had a reference of political statement, it would have been easier to get agreement that that should be one of the topics. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. I, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, Chantal, in the in the first answer. Um, but I, but let's let's ask it again in a, in a slightly more sort of pointed fashion, because we talk about agroecology, for example, you know, being something that's shunted out. So India not wanting to talk about mitigation. Does the COP process, in, in your view, tend to see food systems simply as a problem to fix? Or does it actually see it also as an opportunity to deliver a combination of mitigation and adaptation alongside? food production? Sure. I mean, hypothetically, I would say it does do both things. Um, you know, we as IPES Food have been repeatedly saying that there is no 1.5 degree future without transforming away from industrial food systems specifically. Um, but again, I feel like this year it was really just about putting food systems on the map at COP. You know, that, that was already a big win and that's something that we did achieve. Um, you know, it should be acknowledged that it was unprecedented that the COP presidency dedicated a formal thematic day to agriculture this year. Um, it was on Saturday, November 12th, and that was named Agriculture and Adaptation Day. So, you know, that does show that they're not just seeing it as a problem to fix, but something that can deliver on adaptation, you know, and, and mitigation um, at COP. And just to say that beyond the formal negotiations, this was also the first time that a COP had four formal pav pavilions in the blue zone that were covering food issues. I think someone said there was over 200 side events discussing food and farming. So, you know, food systems were clearly on the radar, both, you know, as a contributor of climate change, but also as part of the solution. And the sticking point, of course, becomes, you know, what do those solutions look like? And how ambitious are governments and the UNFCCC to consider the real transformation that we need to see in food systems? And I think it's very much like the energy discussions happening at COP in that um, acknowledging the problem is just step one, but the more difficult step is, is to figure out how to actually address it. And I was joking at COP that we're at COP 27 and we still haven't figured out what to do with energy. So if food is only on the map this year, is it gonna take 27 more COPs to sort out you know, ourselves for food? Um, yeah, and I think that there was some, some disappointment here as well because this was the Egypt COP, this was the Africa COP, you know, where some of the effects, the worst effects of the food price crisis that we've been feeling this year were felt. You know, we're seeing the escalating impacts of climate change on food and agriculture, especially in some regions of the world. So we were really hoping that this would be the COP that would pick those things up in a meaningful way. But I think official mentions of food systems in any capacity were, were really few and far between um, and weren't particularly picked up in, in formal negotiations as, as much as we would have liked. Yeah, I'm interested. Before we started, we were talking about the way in which COP28 is meant to be the uh, the cop of cop of food. Cop, where, you know, we actually make some progress on food, and of course, as you say, it, it's been 27 cops, and we still haven't sorted energy. So it could be it could be a little while past COP28, uh, you know, even with a fair wind. I'm just curious, you know, sort of because I wasn't at COP this year and so uh, you know within the pavilions that you were in where you've got those sort of various events and various stands uh, being represented for different organizations different interests in agriculture and food systems did you get the sense that there was an equal balance between um, the number of uh, people there lobbyists promoting business as usual and the number of people sort of promoting something you know closer to agroecology and the sorts of things that, that we might be interested in or you know where what was the balance 
I'm happy to go ahead, Patty. I'll, I'll okay. fill in. It depends on which event you're at. <laughs> Who organized it? I, I kind of meant, you know, in, in the sort of the overall, in terms of the various different stands as you walked around, what was your sense? I think it, there is, it's a, it's a range depending on who's on the panel and who organized it, it's really hard to say. There is a, was a good analysis on the smog that looked at, uh, compared to last year, there were twice as many lobbyists from the um, agribusiness industry present, which actually I count as progress, meaning that they're present because they feel like, oh, we need to engage, something is moving in this area. And you know, there's also a high number of fossil fuel lobbyists that were also present and they continue to be present. So. You know, I would, I hope it's not 27 more cops because, you know, allies called for a food day a year ago and unprecedented, we got a food day or agriculture day, close enough, um, one year later. So that's, you know, for gender day, it took many years to okay. get gender recognized. So I think, I think countries, even though they're not willing to kind of give in just now, they do see that it's coming and then the political pressure globally is building. Yeah. Okay. So I just jump on that really quickly, just because I think Patty made the really good point that it depends on what event you were at, right, to see what the solutions being put forward sounded like. And I think that is something that we need to work on moving forward, whether it's at COP28 or just in general, is the fact that, you know, whether we're in the climate space or not, we, we're sort of talking in silos. So, you know, those who are pro agroecology will speak amongst themselves, those who are pro perhaps like techno fixes and innovation will be speaking amongst themselves, um, et cetera, et cetera. Small farmers had plenty of amazing events, but they were largely speaking to, uh, you know, civil society and an advocacy crowd. So there are plenty of great solutions being put out. It's just the fact that we're preaching to the converted in our various spaces. So, you know, when moving forward, how do we start having more difficult and complimentary conversations with each other? Yeah, sure. And if I can add, sorry, one more thing. I know we're <laughs> taking off track a little bit. Um, last year, we said we need to diversify the voices talking about food. And there was acknowledgement. It was like, oh, where do we find them? So this year we do see, and I think partially because it's an, it was an African cop. So you did see more diversity, um, more than usual um, there, more generally, but also on food. So there was an attempt, at least the, you know, the sessions that I was in, um, or at least keeping an eye on, at least having a farmer or a local community member, at least on the panel to give a different perspective. So you didn't have the same global voices that were always there. Um, so I think that was also a difference and the important piece is going forward to make sure that's not a one-time thing for Egypt for COP27, but it really kind of builds up over time. I guess that kind of brings us into the next question that I wanted to ask you, Paddy, which is, uh, you know, it's a frustration of mine that, you know, farm systems and global land use are hugely variable. You know, farm size, what the farm output is, the climate that they're in. And yet international policy processes still seem to talk about food and agriculture, uh, or at least appear to, uh, in terms of a sort of one size fits all uh, approach or a, a space. And certainly, you know, that comes across in the mainstream media, cattle, bad, plants, good no attempt at nuance in between and so I wonder how we can deal with this complexity how we can embed nuance in international frameworks um, particularly at a, at a time when we're facing this looming crisis and there is an urgency uh, you know to move forwards um, so there is talk among some you know basically the the three UN frameworks on climate biodiversity and land degradation need to be better connected under the in the Rio conventions but that is a very technical process and as you even within ministries or companies you have salinization of issues but let me just zone in on on on, on a on climate change um, as kind of because you know they're all quite different international frameworks so you know for you know triple c it started because we had a basically a total global carbon budget Right? We have carbon budget to stay within 1.5 degrees. So the way you measure that is basically a greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So this requires detailed accounting by country, by sector, looking at specific sources, and therefore you look at you know the uh, wedges is what they talk, talk about it, pathways, um, and a primary metric which is driving the prioritization and action is around greenhouse gas emissions. But when you're talking about land use, it's more than just greenhouse gas emissions, right? You have other environmental health uh, um, indicators, as well as on livelihoods. And, and uh, so all that comes in, but when the mandate for the framework is around greenhouse gas emissions, it just 
forces kind of a narrow view. So try to break out of that is hugely challenging, not to mention that the way the food systems, at least the industrialized food system is structured is around maximizing yield. So you put those to get together and then you get very simplified approaches um, or solutions that are suggested uh, when in fact, you know, it's of course much more nuanced and, and complex. So, you know, the kind of a good example is, is around methane emissions, which is a huge deal right now. There's a global methane pledge, mostly around uh, gas, fossil fuel, but some aspect related to uh, agriculture, but it still looks at the source. So the emissions per cow, rather than looking at what are the kind of drivers um, on, for example, looking at industrial livestock production, intensive livestock production and expansion. And if you try to bring in those broader indicators on biodiversity and environmental health impacts, you get kind of to a different set of issues or broader set of issues and may perhaps different set of solutions of what needs to be tackled. And perhaps it may seem harder, of course, because it's systemic, but it's something that perhaps policymakers find it difficult because it makes them have to coordinate across, you know, other government ministries as well. And of course, there's a there's an internal conflict in that sort of approach on methane, certainly in terms of, you know, dealing with ruminant uh, livestock, that if you want to control the feed to that extent, if you want to stick in these additives, then you need to be able to control, you know, where the animals are feeding and make sure that they are feeding in the way. And, and in and in that way, you're sort of supporting and, and pushing things back towards a more intensive form of, uh, of, of production where, you know, if those animals were out in, this, in the field in a regenerative or agroecological system, there'd be much less control in the, uh, the feed additives that, that are being provided to try and reduce the methane. So, so nothing's nothing easy. easy. Um, Adele, I want to bring you in in just a second, but just one more question, Patty, if I may, for you. And thanks so much for that. The principle of a loss and damage fund has been one, and this is something that, you know, has been talked about quite a lot in the press. It's been, you know, one of these things that's been seen as a win, but of course there's no detail. And we've also heard that arguably the time spent winning it could have been much better spent on getting existing uh, mechanisms to work better. So the question really is, is the loss and damage fund really a win? And where and how should the funding be directed? So yes, it is a win. This is the one thing where it was a priority for the Egyptian presidency, and we must give it credit for that. Um, you know, vulnerable countries, developed countries have been asking for this for 30 years, and it's been blocked by industrialized countries, developed countries all that time for fear of many cases of, of basically opening up uh, to being sued for causing of damage. You know, it's expected that from extreme weather events, it will cost over $200 billion annually. Um, and so you're already seeing droughts and hunger in the Horn of Africa, flooding in West Africa and Pakistan. And this fund is meant to compensate countries that have already suffered from the impacts of climate change. So it's different from adaptation, how you adapt or mitigation. It's a really a very distinct fund. Um, and of course the details, so acknowledgement is the first step and it really signifies a mindset shift, an acknowledgement that climate change is no longer about the future, it is here, it's happening now. But you know, it's gonna take a while to negotiate how big is to fund, who's going to contribute to fund, um, and you know, how it will be paid out and all of that. But you know, just that kind of, you know, that political signal is really important at this point. I mean, one of the uh, one of the things that the EU uh, was saying in advance of COP was that you know, look, there are existing mechanisms like the World Bank. Why don't we just use the World Bank to deliver the kinds of funding um, that the loss and damage fund uh, should do? And that you know now we've got the agreement to the loss and damage fund. It could take you know a long time to set up the mechanisms to actually achieve this. Do you think that there's any merit to that argument? I mean, I know the EU have backed away from it, but do you think there was merit in, in it in the first place? I am not an expert on World Bank, uh, so it's hard for me to say now, you know, you don't find, you know, there's the Green Climate Fund, there's adaptation facilities, these are all separate funds that are not going through World Bank or other existing institutions, so I think likely they'll want to see a separate facility or fund set up that is managed, you know, probably who gets to manage that and who gets to be on that is very different because, you know, the World Bank, you know, who, who appoints the kind of head of the World Bank is the U.S. Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are politics behind these organizations. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Adele, thanks very much. You've been sitting there very patiently. Let me come to you. Our farmers are on the front line in terms of addressing the climate crisis. You know, one of the things during COVID, we all, uh, certainly in the UK, went outside on our doorsteps clapping for the NHS because during that, during the pandemic, you know, they they were the people who were supporting us and uh, and working on a day to day basis to try and help us through that. It seems to me that farmers are very much at the vanguard of the climate and nature crisis but mitigation has always seemed fairly top line and remote uh, you know when you're just working on the ground while adaptation can provide clear actions for all farmers individually on soil health nutrient cycling etc i wonder if you think the time has come to really start emphasizing the adaptation element alongside mitigation of course in order to start demonstrating to the public and to policymakers that farming is genuinely a part of the solution and not just part of the problem yeah i do and firstly just to say um thanks to um patty and chantelle i think your analysis uh, is fascinating and i think i think in a way we had very different cops so it's it's really it's really useful to hear your perspectives on things and um to your point um finlow i i you know i think it's great agriculture was included as a the thematic day as agriculture and adaptation as has been said um you know i i kind of I was thinking about it more in the last 24 hours and i actually think both words aren't quite um aren't quite appropriate for agriculture you know mitigation yes of course we need to do less harm um, to reduce the impact of climate change we need to um, emit less um, greenhouse gases use less fossil fuels do less pollution etc and of course like we'd be kidding ourselves if we if we weren't also helping farmers adapt to a changing climate be it differing temperatures droughts flooding um, we need to do both of those things but actually what what both of those words if you take them very literally miss out is the fact that agriculture can be a huge part of the solution um, and that's you know through drawing carbon back down um, into soil carbon um, reintegrating trees back into farming systems uh, nature of course clean water livelihoods um, there's so many there's so many different facets that agriculture can bring to this debate and I actually don't I don't think either of those terms quite quite fit the bill. Um, I think, I think, as you say, I think there's room in adaptation to think about some of these new mechanisms that we can hopefully help help farmers move to soil carbon sequestration, for example. Um, we were hosted by an amazing group um, whilst we were in Egypt called SEKEM, um, S-E-K-E-M, for anyone who wants to look it up. Um, and they are a organic biodynamic farming group um, in Egypt. They have farms outside Cairo, um, about six hours south of Cairo. Their main farm is about one hour out of Cairo. And then they also have some farms up near the Suez Canal. And it's all farmed um, uh, in a biodynamic way using compost. And they've just launched this um, soil carbon credit scheme um, at COP, uh, which is um, you know, hugely successful. They're able to pr uh, provide the farmers that are part of their sort of cooperative group with these these new credit payments, um, and it's allowing it's allowing those farmers to take more steps to sequestering more to more carbon, and they're literally turning sand into you know beautiful soil where they're growing herbs, fruits, vegetables, um, in an incredibly sustainable way. Um, so I think I think there's there's things happening. Um, it was it was super inspiring to see that in Egypt, where the COP was taking place, um, and and Sekem have estimated that if all Egyptian farmers um, took up these practices of composting and rotation to build um, soil carbon, they could offset twenty five percent of Egypt's total greenhouse gas emissions, which is it's amazing. So we need to we need to think about not just mitigation, not just adaptation, but how do we how do we help farming become part of the solution. And of course, if uh, if you're thinking about those systems where they're starting to regreen an area that was essentially uh, desert, then there's a cooling impact associated with that as well. So mm -hmm. it's not just the mitigation; it's the active cooling that's taking place, mm -hmm. as well as then you know the further adaptation. And I and I guess you know part of my question is around the way in which. Uh, <laughs> sequestration is something that I think by and large farms have started to become interested in because there's a price tag associated with it. You know, you can plant some trees and you can get some funding in order to be able to, to, to deliver that in one way or another. 
Whereas with soil health and nutrient cycling, these things that help with the adaptation element, actually, regardless of whether you're being paid for that, there is an incentive to do it. It makes your business more resilient. It, it helps you to become more productive. And so if there are ways of, um, you know, regardless of people's attitude to climate change in and of itself, just helping farmers to understand that these processes are about making their farms work better. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think we've got to introduce new financing schemes for farmers, both from governments, but also the private sector to help de-risk that transition for farmers, um, because it is it is to a degree for many farmers a, a leap into the slight unknown, particularly when you're reducing your dependence on external inputs like nitrogen, which in a way is going to be playing out over the next six to eight months anyway, with the shortage of fertilizer as a result of the Ukraine crisis. Um, and so it, it's it's a really risky business for farmers right now, and we've got to help cushion that risk and actually provide a really positive business case um, to effectively make it a no brainer to transition and introduce, you know, not not just kind of go down the soil carbon sequestration route, but also do things like nutrient cycling rotations and those sorts of things as well. Now, you said in the past that you think the private sector and, of course, you know, farming and agriculture and most of the food system you know, actors are, are part of the private sector in one way or another, but that they're going to be at the vanguard of change rather than governments, that governments will follow rather than lead. Surely, by definition, the private sector serves itself while governments are at least supposed to have society's best interests at heart. Why is it, do you think, that governments are failing? And what is it that makes you think that private enterprise can succeed uh, in their stead? I think, I think there's, many, there's many reasons why government are, uh, I think, just moving too slowly. They're too cumbersome. Um, and um, there's so much bureaucracy surrounding everything. As Patty was saying, you have a, a negotiation and stuff is constantly going in and out and in and out and in and out and nothing really changes at the end of it. Um, and I think that's where private sector can play a role in, in being more nimble more quickly. Um, and so um, during this COP, Patrick Holden and I were, um, were mainly uh, with businesses, um, primarily surrounding um, His Majesty's Sustainable Markets Initiative, which, which had a summit at the event or outside of the main event, but um, in Sharm el Sheikh. And um, it, for me, was uh, it, it, it very... It made me feel very encouraged that whilst we were hearing, um, you know, qu quite a lot of sort of exasperation coming from the blue zone with the government negotiations going on, um, that actually the companies were stepping up and saying, no, we can we can do this. And these are the things we're we're committed to doing by this time next year. And of course, um, these commitments are just words until they actually happen. And uh, we see our role as a sort of little NGO amongst these giant businesses um, to, to hold their feet to the fire, basically, and make sure they do follow up on the things that they have promised to. Um, but I think private sector can move more quickly. And you have to remember that most of these large companies are bigger than some of the countries that are represented. So um, I was talking to Mars, for example, their land impact is bigger than the country of Panama. So, you know, it's it's really we're talking country sized companies here and so they they should really you know be involved in in uh in 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 this process and uh, i feel optimistic about what they can do but we really have to hold them to account and if we think of a company like mars then you know that's it's not just a few tweaks around the edges, is it? It's it's understanding that it's actually it's not just about their farmers having to change, but it's about their whole approach to business that will have to change ultimately. Uh, you know, the way that they uh, they they get the ingredients that they're using, the way that they operate within the marketplace. I mean, all kinds of different things that are going to have to change in terms of their business model. Do you think they get that? Because I know the report that you mentioned, I think, is the Terracotta report um, on SMIs. And to be honest, it's quite hard to find on Google. So if you can give us the, the pr proper name of it, I'd appreciate that, Adele, because people can look at it because it's, it's a fantastic report. It really does a great job uh, of encapsulating the things that we're talking about here. But do you think that the signatories to that report, like Mars, really genuinely get that it's such a big change and are genuinely committed to it? I think they're, let's say they're, they're on a journey to getting it. I think there's there's some actually very um, sort of enlightened CEOs and um, top sort of senior team within these com um, companies 
who, who really are starting to understand the complexity of the challenge we face. And that, as you say, it's not just about tweaking around the edges, it's actually um, sort of reform of supply chains and the way they, the way they do business. Um, so it's it's a it's a huge challenge, and of course you've got to you know it's got to be an orderly transition, um, uh, as as is the case with energy as well. Um, I mean, real credit to to the king in bringing all these different companies together through the Sustainable Markets Initiative, because what it does is it puts them all in a room together. They're all facing very similar challenges from their own different industries that they all represent. And I think it allows for that kind of cross-sector collaboration, new ideas sparking up that actually they probably wouldn't they wouldn't have if they weren't you know sitting in a room together um, at these these very nice receptions with the king. So um, so it's it's uh, it's really interesting to watch that dynamic play out. Um, and of course now the challenge is okay. Well, if the CEO gets it um, and the people in their top team get it, how do you make sure that filters through the rest of the, 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 the company, which is a really big challenge. And of course, shareholders as well is another really big challenge. Um, because often but, it can feel like you're sort of talking to people who are in middle management level and, yeah. you know, and, and they, they struggle, you know, just to make the change in both directions. And that, that change really has got to come from the top. Um, Patty, land use change needs to be part of the solution everywhere. But for many farmers, agroecological transition is inherently risky. We've touched on this a little bit um, already. It's a big change to the status quo for them. And certainly in our work, we've often found that transformation on individual farms has been driven by a personal or financial crisis and need to step off that expensive and often exhausting production treadmill. Now, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, your organisation that you represent, look closely at the role of of nationally determined contributions, the NDCs that are part of the COP process in supporting transition, knowledge exchange and market reform. And I just wonder if you could summarize what you discovered. Sure, well, this links back to my previous comment about the challenge of breaking out of kind of very narrowed focus on greenhouse gas emissions. So as a way to, to kind of introduce, well, what does it mean to apply food systems thinking to the NDCs, which essentially are climate action plans by countries um, as to indicate their contribution to reaching the Paris Agreement, which is to get to globally to below one and a half degrees. Um, so we developed a framework which looked at how you would integrate this kind of thinking. And it's more than just the contest, more than just saying you have to do agroecology and you have to do food loss and waste and you have to do shift diets and consumption patterns. It's also looking at governance processes, which are just as important. So who is engaged? Were health stakeholders engaged? Were farmers, smallholder farmers, youth, women, were they engaged? How were they engaged? How were their comments taken to account? Um, and then what types of... Uh, measures or programs that that lead to from that consultation process, then how is that financed? Um, how's it being implemented, right? So one of the big issues, and we, we applied this, this framework, we developed it first and we applied it to 14 countries. So four in Africa, we applied it to the UK plus three countries in, in within the EU, US, Canada, Colombia, China, Vanuatu and, and Bangladesh. Um, so we wanted to have the diversity of perspectives and we knew going in that we were gonna find like the, the best example, because the idea of thinking about food systems was, is very new in the climate agenda. You see it now more in words, but actually applying it in practice is still very challenging. Um, and so what we found is that, you know, there are some bright spots. For example, Colombia really kind of did an extensive uh, consultation engagement process, which led to a lot of uh, um, very diverse proposals. Um, and, you know, the kind of takeaway is, is if you're not engaging the right people, one, you might not get the solutions you're looking for with climate co-benefits, and two, you're not going to get the ownership for implementation. We also published a, a follow-up analysis which looked at, well, in the NDCs, how much are countries asking for, for their, um, for food systems related measures, and how much is actually being allocated overall. Uh, for food systems from climate, from public sector climate finance. What we found that, you know, Chantel mentioned earlier that one third of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from food systems. Well, only 3% of climate finance goes to, to food systems. So there's a huge discrepancy in the NDCs itself of the, uh, we looked at the 167 that were submitted 
Um, and of those, look at the developing countries, so basically the ones who usually are recipients of climate finance, only 14 billion was, um, was named in total for food systems versus 64 billion for clean energy and, and, and clean transport. So just even the kind of the thinking about, first of all, if you don't prioritize food systems and actually be very concrete about what you want to do and then um, cost it out as something that needs funding, you're not gonna get funding or financing um, from governments. Um, and we also looked at, well, actually, Besides climate finance, there's a much bigger pot of public sector financing going towards food systems. Um, and that's in the form of, of subsidies for agricultural production. So over 600 billion a year goes towards agricultural production and 86% actually has no guardrails for climate, health or environment, which means there's no conditionality, whether you can use pesticides, whether you can use how much fertilizer, what types of chemicals, and so it just, it just goes straight out there and it's not at all aligned with our climate objectives. So even a first step beyond climate is just thinking through the policy firm of what's underpinning the current uh, kind of global industrialized food system. If we don't start to shift and, and repurpose and redirect it towards farming that is more nature friendly, like agroecology, that is more equitable, um, then we're not gonna see the type of changes. And, and just kind of feeding back on, on um, what Adele was saying, you know, of course there are progressive companies that are first movers and we need them, but then there is still kind of the rest of the private sector that unless they see writing on the wall, they see that they're gonna have stranded assets. They see government regulation coming down the line at some point, they're not going to shift as well. So we need to show, we need progressive companies to show that it is doable, it's possible, but we also need government regulation as well to shift the rest of the market. Thank you so much, Paddy. I mean, it's just so much to think about in that. Um, I mean, one of one of my questions, I suppose, around it is where where the money most needs to be targeted. If we're talking about energy, then you know there's a, a degree to which lots of investment in uh, in new technology and ways of deploying that new technology is really helpful to help that sort of R and D at the same time as then potentially supporting and subsidising the installation of, of you know the, essentially a new wind farm or, or whatever else it happens to be in the future. With land, where does that money need to go, do you think? Is it about just simply funding farmers to do, do something differently? It is, about, is it about knowledge exchange or does technology play a role in that as well? I think it needs to be context specific. And, you know, from our perspective, it's not just we need more finance for food systems, but it's how that finance is structured and who gets to be at the table in discussing how to structure it um, and, and what it funds. And right now it's usually kind of held, I mean, a lot of the climate finance, it goes from, you know, these kind of funds like green climate funds or international fund for agricultural development, it goes to governments. Yeah. Okay. So, and then who are the governments consulting? Who's engaged in those processes? Oftentimes they're not engaging enough or the right people. Um, so it gets stuck there. So there's there's a lot and and so, and just on kind of innovation, yes, but it's not just technological innovation, right? It's not just peer-to-peer -peer learning. So there's a lot of great examples of different ways we can think about innovation, whether it's not, it's also social innovation, um, as well as, you know, like the initiative that, that Adele brought up, SECM. There, there are a lot of these great kind of community-led um, initiatives, which could be funded and, and scaled up. Um, in a way, and I, I say scale in a, in a broad sense, like, you know, you don't want to repeat kind of the issues of the past, but each, each one is quite specific to their context. But there are ways in which, you know, in the broader sense, scale, like the type of principles-based, values-based, the way that they are set up uh, uh, to lead, that leads to their success, that type of thinking requires also different way of thinking from um, governments, um, as well as from the private sector. Okay, 
Thank you. Chantal, Christiana Figueres, who was the um, self-proclaimed anyway, power behind the Paris Agreement, I know that she was, uh, recently lamented that 30 years or so ago, the UN decided to split action on nature into the three separate mechanisms that we mentioned earlier. So climate, biological diversity and desertification. She always talks about that being, you know, one of the biggest mistakes that was made by the UN. Now, food systems more than anything else connect these processes back again. So looking ahead to COP15 on biological diversity and back towards the Food Systems Summit last year, are there ways in which this climate COP did anything to contribute to a more joined up approach to nature regeneration? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question and a really good point. And I certainly saw more discussion this year than in previous years, making the link between climate and biodiversity specifically. I think desertification often is the, the forgotten cop um, and that the, that's the one that tends to be left out. But I saw a lot of discussion happening around climate and biodiversity, especially as it related to food systems, which was very heartening, I think. Um, there is always the, the the Rio Conventions Pavilion that's present at the COPs that always tries to make the link between these three conversations. But again, I think so far this has all been acknowledged in, in rhetoric mostly and not necessarily through any kind of concrete action. Um, you know, that being said, I think there was an interesting initiative, uh, the ICANN initiative, I think it's the Initiative on Climate Action and Nutrition, that links not the two issues or not the issues you mentioned, but that links nutrition and climate action. And so for me, these are the kinds of initiatives that are starting to come out in the climate space, which are exciting to me because they are starting to make the link between climate and everything else that climate touches on. Um, and also the link, as we said, between food systems and everything else that touches on. So, you know, this that specific initiative was launched by the COP presidency and the WHO, if I'm not mistaken. I think the FAO has some involvement, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but you know, again, again, it's showing how these crucial issues can be linked in these spaces if we think about them in a more comprehensive way. And again, I'm, I'm repeating things here, but food systems are really the linchpin for a lot of that because you know, what else can tackle hunger and malnutrition, climate, biodiversity, revitalization of natural resources than food systems? So you know, if COP did anything to in, in that direction, I think it would be through some of these initiatives and pledges that we saw, not necessarily in the in the formal spaces, but that were that were made around them. Um, and I would say that if, if there was anything that did more concretely link biodiversity, um, climate and desertification, it was actually a lot of the farmer representation that was at COP. Um, and you know, a lot of these voices were a bit marginalized um, at, at, uh, within the negotiations, but we saw a lot of action from the part of AFSA, the African Food Sovereignty Alliance, who really pushed for you know, these more diverse agroecological food systems and showed you know, very concretely through their events how farming systems can be the means to create resilient livelihoods, biodiversity and soil restoration, you know, just, just tackling all these issues at the same time. And we saw similar messages from uh, I think other farmer constituencies to indigenous people's constituencies. And, and again, many of these voices that tend to be marginalized, they're the ones who are carrying these truly comprehensive and holistic solutions, but are often again, left out of debate. So it's, it's a bit frustrating because those links are being made. They're just not being, uh, what's the word in English, kind of valorized or, or you know, valued as they should be. And, and it, it, it makes me think as well, you know, about the difficulty around, you know, carbon tunnel vision that, you know, conversations that we've all had, you know, in the past and probably, you know, various times in the past about the way in which if we focus too hard in on greenhouse gas reduction, then we miss opportunities or we, uh, we subvert opportunities that we could be uh, using to try and get nature to function better, uh, you know, across the board uh, at the same time as producing better nutrition, etc. And that, you know, we can sometimes cut off our nose to spite our face and we may need to accept that there's a slightly less um, uh, optimal uh, climate outcome or greenhouse gas outcome in one aspect, but it helps to deliver these other, other aspects. And so that, that joining back up of this conversation is so critically important. And it's good to hear that it's happening a little bit, but perhaps I, I can hear within what you're saying, Chantel, that there are, um, there are areas that, you know, you're sort of identifying as you speak there, uh, you know, where we need to be more successful in the lobbying that we do in the future and, and have more events discussing these things in the future, perhaps. Patty, I mean, Chantelle touched on the whole health and nutrition thing, but could you go into it in a bit more detail? The health and nutrition have increasingly been discussed alongside climate change and nature. And I wonder to what extent you think a health lens can help people to change the narrative in favour of greater land and dietary diversity? 
Absolutely. Well, you know, my my uh, my title is climate and health, so of course I naturally see the link between the two. You know, actually, my background I come from more energy, and I've seen the health sector come in and they weigh in very heavily on uh, health angles to climate change, mostly focused today on energy, the energy transition, fossil fuel phase out, air pollution, but they increasingly have a voice. Um, around food and nutrition as well. So, you know, we, we actually did a survey through with uh, kind of global health networks and mo majority found that, yes, sustainable and, and healthy diets are really important in the context of climate change. Um, and so that's one aspect of where health and food come together. It's diets, it's food insecurity, hunger, um, micronutrient deficiencies. It's also around zoonosis um, and antimicrobial diseases. Um, with, for example, livestock encroaching on forests or excessive use of antibiotics. It's also around unsafe and contaminated foods. So, you know, viruses and bacteria or chemical residues from pesticides. It's um, environmental contamination and, and degradation. So fertilizer runoff, for example, or excess manure um, or endocrine disrupting, disrupting chemicals or growth hormones in, in livestock. And finally, you have worker safety issues. So whether it's farmers, fishers, it's other workers in the food chain, chemical exposure, stress, injuries. I mean, all these aspects really touch on. And so, you know, for those in the climate space, maybe they only see right now diets and food security as, as the main angle. But I think if we bring in these other aspects it, for governments and for stakeholders, it makes a stronger um, near term kind of case for action than if you just focus on greenhouse gas emissions uh, specifically. And, and just to kind of, you know, one more comment, because Adele was mentioning kind of the, you know, new commitments by major companies uh, to support regenerative agriculture, and especially food companies. One thing we haven't heard, so I applaud that because I think that's important looking at the supply chain and, and where they're sourcing. But many of these companies are also, um, you know, their profits come from processing. And what we haven't talked about in the climate discussion is healthy diets. So there is still, you, you know, you have basically huge health um, issues from consumption of ultra processed foods, um, high sugars, high fats. Um, and so as if we're not addressing health impacts from food as part of the shift in kind of diets and consumption patterns, then we're also not addressing climate change fully and holistically. So that's something that, you know, as we kind of move more into this kind of what to how, I think we need to be really uh, kind of think carefully about what this means and make sure that we don't create unintended consequences uh, for human health. Thanks very much. Um, I'm aware that it's it's 10 to I've got one more question that I want to ask Adele. And then really, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat, but it, you know, there are really two questions that seem to sort of be running around. So I'm, I'm going to come to those in just a second. Um, and I'm, I'm still going to try and finish at, at three o'clock pretty much on the nose. Um, Adele, if not a consensus, then there's certainly a growing global movement towards an agroecological transition that will benefit everybody in terms of climate and biodiversity and, and people, you know, more generally economies. But there's also a great deal of fear, um, particularly from governments, that agroecology just can't feed the world and that the level of disruption in transitioning from business as usual to agroecology is just too big to manage. And I wonder if what you think about that and whether this COP did anything to start changing that perception, particularly amongst leaders in richer nations. Yeah, it's a really it's a really big argument that's still going on. And um, we were talking at the beginning about you know, the degree of consensus, I suppose, um, around what what the future of food and farming looks like. And there is still a lot of confusion um, and a lot of differing views. Um, for example, I think the fertilizer companies, although they are making commitments to reduce you know, how much fertilizer they're generally selling to farmers they're also seeing for example africa is not as a market they haven't yet um broken into and then of course you get the people arguing that well if you know if we if we're going to feed 10 billion people then we need these inputs to produce more food in in parts of the world like like africa um which we would very much 
disagree with for, for multiple reasons, which we don't have time to go into necessarily. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think we absolutely can feed the world's population with agroecological regenerative farming techniques. Um, some things will just need to change, not least what we eat. Uh, we'll need to eat um, a different sort of variety of foods, more, more sort of seasonal based on the landscape around us. Um, as a global population, we'll need to reduce meat consumption, but recognizing um, there are uh, livestock that are incredibly important as part of the climate solution. Um, so we need to, you know, stop eating ideally intensive pork and poultry, and of course, you know, dairy and beef from, from intensive systems. But but really make sure when we do eat meat that it's it's part of the the right type of farming systems, and. Um, and so, uh, and waste is the other big issue as well. We're, we're wasting between a third and a, and, a, and half of all the food we produce and eat. So if you kind of think about those calories, the whole the whole argument is just flawed at the moment. So um, we really need to do more research. Uh, we, we did our Feeding Britain from the Ground Up report, which found we could maintain our food security in the UK um, if we transitioned to fully sort of regenerative agroecological farming systems. It's just the, the nature of our plates would need to look a little bit different. Um, and I think the same is true across the world. We just need to do that research to understand how we can align our diets with the productive capacity of farms around us, basically. Um, stop wasting so much uh, and, and eat a greater diversity of, of foods, whole foods, um, rather than fermented foods, uh, which I can see coming up quite a lot in the chat. Yeah, and we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, there are a couple of questions here that I'm going to go to from the audience now, if that's all right. And I, I was going to ask this question, but I, I, I'm not now, which is how much in percentage terms of farmland um, would we lose if we follow the actual path of two degrees Celsius? And I think, um, I mean, my, my immediate answer to that is it's complicated and, and very difficult to answer in, 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 in simple terms. But I think that Adele, uh, your answer to the last question to an extent dealt with that it's about it's about you know change and, and adaptation of diets as much as it is uh, about uh, adaptation of land use um the question that i wonder if if uh, speakers could have a bit of a go at um i mean reboot food has been mentioned i don't want to give too much time and credence to them because they're just a new campaign and and who knows how successful they will be but the concept of the technologies and precision fermentation which has been given such a uh, you know, a kind of a big voice, particularly recently by people like George Monbiot, um, you know, where there's these suggestions that livestock should just be eradicated from the countryside and we should all move to precision fermentation instead, you know, at one end of the extreme, um, at, at, at one extreme, and then, you know, at the other end, there could just be a little bit of an inclusion of some of these things to replace some of the proteins and other nutritions that people need. So the question really is, what role do you see for technology um, in terms of replacing some of the basic land use that we have, I suppose. Anybody want to start on that? Otherwise I'll pick on somebody. Chantel. Yeah. I'm happy to give it a go first. And I think I'm gonna look big picture here rather than give a precise answer, but we've overused this imagery, but you know, we keep saying that food systems is at a crossroads. And, and I think, you know, if that can't be under overstated, you know, because we, we have one path leading us down what I'll call business as usual, uh, you know, with kind of systems being tweaked around the edges, which we've said already, and, you know, where we try to think of how we can improve the practices that we have today, just, you know, just enough, you know, just enough to get us to somewhere better. My issue with those solutions, and I'll put a lot of the tech solutions that are being put out under this kind of paradigm, is that they're still operating under what's inherently this still, this, this kind of industrial logic for our food systems, you know, based on specialization, commodification, capitalism, you know, I've said the, the big C word, and, and things like that. But then, you know, we have this other pathway as I mentioned, that is being put forward by smallholder farmers, by indigenous communities, by local communities around the world that are really based on just rethinking our food systems completely, you know, based on diversification, on land sharing rather than land sparing, on justice, food sovereignty, regen, agroecology, whatever you want to call it. And under these approaches, you know, I think most of the world right now, most smallholder farmers are trying something that looks like this model. Um, you know, they just need the support to be able to do it. So, you know, these solutions, these tech solutions may be some part of that first kind of pathway that I've described. But if we really want to think, you know, ambitiously tra in a transformative way, we need to consider the second pathway. And for me, a lot of those technologies just, it's not that they're irrelevant, but they don't have as much of a place in that second scenario because we are trying to do things in a different way that we haven't really tried before. And for me, that's much more exciting and that's where we should be putting our energy. 
Beautifully put. Thank you, Chantelle. Anybody else got anything to add there to that? It's, I, think, it's, I think you summed it up perfectly, Chantelle. I think it's, it's a, I see it a little bit like vertical farming, as you say, it's got a really, you know, potentially got an important place. But to me, it's always going to op operate in that sort of niche of um, filling, filling a gap um, in places where you potentially can't produce healthy, nutritious, nutritious food on the land. Um, and uh, so not totally against the idea in principle, but I think, you know, wiping farming off uh, the face of the planet effectively is just actually really irresponsible and quite arrogant. Um, so um, I would I would put it in the sort of niche of technology that can form a small part of the solution in certain scenarios. Mm. It's, it's, it's kind of a, an important niche. It just seems like mm. it's, it's a good way to describe it while there's actually transformation going on within, um, you know, food supply chains and, and on the ground itself to deliver all of these various different aspects across nature from biodiversity, um, loss reduction and biodiversity, loss reduction, whatever that is, uh, <laughs> biodiversity restoration um, and the reversal of desertification, as well as these climate outcomes. There's one final question that I want to go to. And perhaps, Patty, I can come to you um, first on this and the question is around um, the role of consumer education and and I guess the question really is about um, where where change should come from in the marketplace whether it should be bottom up whether it should be about farmers for example saying well our land can grow this and therefore we're going to supply this and that's the way the market changes or whether that pressure should be coming from the consumer end and how um, consumers can be mobilized to put that pressure into place i mean i was on a panel discussion at Cop, hosted by consumers international with a kind of an oxford style debate where um I had to play the role of, of, uh, of saying that just more information for consumers wasn't enough. Um, so yes, there is a role for information out there for consumers, especially by companies. But I also believe that information um, and access to information uh, is asymmetrical in terms of what actually gets disclosed, what are the metrics used for disclosing it, um, and just the amount of you know, money that is spent on marketing um, and control of that information leaves consumers in a in a kind of a uh, in a position where they don't know what to believe, they don't know what's true, um, they don't they actually don't even understand what's on their labels, and so you know, you need the role of government to to kind of regulate that information and regulate what can be disclosed in order to create kind of a level playing field and to help consumers be able to kind of access. On the other hand, you do need consumers because they need to feel like it's not just government telling them what to do. They need to feel empowered and wanting to see the change and that it's good for not only for the planet, it's good for them, their families. So it, it is both that needs to happen in, in tandem. Of course, that is our challenge, but it can't be all just on consumer behavior alone. Thank you. Any other final thoughts from the other two panelists? Nothing particular to add on the. It's it's Adele. I'd be interested in that sort of in that role. Sorry, my um, phone is going off to say I need to pick up the kids from school. Thankfully, somebody else is doing that today. Um, Adele, whether um, whether where you see the balance lie, whether it's about consumers making the change and forcing the change, or whether it's farmers uh, and farmer upwards. I think it's really got to be kind of pressure points from all sides. I think I think citizens are an incredibly powerful force. Um, they put the heat on um, companies uh, when they're when they're demanding different things in the supermarket, let's say, um, and they also also vote um, for different governments uh, based on their policies, hopefully. Um, so, um, so I, I think I do think citizens hold the key to a lot of this change. Um, but we also need to preempt some of what they're wanting. Um, companies need to need to lead the way um, and I think governments need to be more bold so um, so I, th I think it's really got to be kind of all sides pushing together and not no one relying on another group to to, to be a first mover um, I heard something really interesting about companies the other day um, all companies want to be the first at being second 
Um, and uh, I think I think that's so true. And I think it's the same with governments as well. It's like they, they all want to do something and they all want to lead the way, but they actually don't want to be the first one. And I think we need to stop. We need to stop with that. We're in a crisis and just everyone like play their part, uh, whether you're a first mover or not. Fantastic. That's a great place to end. So thanks so much. That is all we have time for. It's been a fascinating hour. Thanks so much to all of our panellists. Um, Chantal Wei Ying Clement from IPES Food, Adele Jones from the Sustainable Food Trust, and Patty Fong from the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. And thank you to you too, wherever you are in the world, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. And thanks for your contributions and the chat uh, and everything that's been going on in the chat, which I can only keep half an eye on as I go, I find. Um, so if you want to listen again, this webinar will be available on the Food and Global Security Network YouTube channel later today, and then released as a Farmgate podcast in due course. I've been Finlow Castain. Thank you for joining us um, and goodbye. <laughs>